Well, good morning to all of you. If I haven't had the good fortune to get to meet you yet, I hope that happens uh, sometime soon. My name is Chris Sturgeon. I'm the care pastor here at Ascent. Uh, and if you weren't with us last week, we kicked off a brand new series called Strength in the Storm, Lessons from the Book of Job. We're going through a book in the Old Testament uh, called Job. It's spelled like Job, but it's just an inside thing. We all know we're supposed to say Job. None of us know why, but we do. Um, and if you're not familiar with that story, it, do, it actually is an antecedent to a modern literary work that you may be more uh, familiar with. And that, of course, is a book called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. You guys know this one? Yeah. Very popular book in my house. Um, Job is like the prequel to Alexander's Story And it's a, it's a story about a time in a man named Job's life that goes very, very poorly for him. Uh, but to get you caught up on the story, it's important to understand where Job started, because when it, when it started, things were going amazing in Job's life. And I'll let the book of Job tell you that. So this is Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. If you look back at those numbers, you realize that literally everything in Job's life was a 10 out of 10. He had seven sons and three daughters, seven plus three, 10. He had 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, seven plus three, 10. He had 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys, five plus five, also 10. Everything was a 10 out of 10 in this guy's life. He really was doing well. And then he has his terrible horrible, no good, very bad day. And it's kind of stretched out in the narrative. So here's the highlights. He's sitting at home and a, a messenger comes into his house looking very disheveled and harried. And this guy says, master, the Sabians, now the Sabians were like a neighboring tribe, says, the Sabians came and they stole all of your oxen and donkeys and they killed all of the servants tending them. I alone survived to come and tell you. And then it says that while that servant was still speaking, another messenger comes in. This guy looks very similar, except he smells like a barbecue. And he says, Master, the fire of the Lord fell from heaven on all of your sheep and burned them up and all of the servants who were tending them. I alone survived to come and tell you this. And while he's still speaking, wouldn't you know it? Another messenger comes in. And this one says, Master, the Chaldeans, they stole all your camels and they killed all of the servants who were watching them. I alone survived to come and tell you. And of course, while he's speaking, one more messenger comes in and he says, Master, a great wind was stirred up in the desert and it blew against the house where all 10 of your children were having dinner together and the house collapsed and they are all dead. I alone escaped from the house to come and tell you this. That's a lot of bad news in one day. And then to make it worse, the Bible tells us that Job himself then becomes covered from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet in what they call loathsome sores. Open, so he's like got shingles everywhere maybe. This is a terrible, horrible, no good very, very, very bad day. And that is the context within which the majority of the story is going to unfold because news about what has happened to Job gets out. And three of Job's friends, upon hearing it, they travel from afar to come and meet with Job to check in on him. And this is what the Bible tells us about them. This is Job chapter two, verses 11 through 13. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all these troubles that had come upon him, each of them set out from his home, Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuite, and Zophar, the Namathite. They met together to go and console and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes 
and threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. Job's friends hear the bad news, and they can't stay apart. They come to him in order to comfort and console him. Now, their attempts to do that form the majority of the book of Job. Each of them, in turn, they're going to take turns giving speeches to Job, trying to comfort and console him, and then Job will speak back to them. That that goes on for like uh, about 35 chapters. And at this point, it's important to remember that often in the Bible, what we get is a really clear example of what not to do. It is not always a book designed to tell us how to behave in a particular circumstance because what becomes incredibly clear is that Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar are really terrible at offering comfort and consolation. Here's some highlights from their attempts. Eliphaz goes first. So after they've sat with Job in the silence for seven days and seven nights, Eliphaz stands up and he starts talking. This is Job chapter 5, verse 17. How happy is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. Essentially saying, you know, Job, if you really think about it, you should be happy about this, right? Yeah, no, this is good. Think of all the free time you'll have now, huh? It's like retirement started early. Job will speak back to him and disagrees with Eliphaz's um, ability to to put his his finger right onto the heart of what's going on in Job's life. So Bildad gets up and he tries next, but listen to what Bildad says. This is Job chapter eight, verses four through seven. If your children sinned against him, he delivered them into the power of their transgression. If you will seek God and make supplication to the almighty, if you are pure and upright, surely then he will rouse himself for you and restore to you your rightful place. Though your beginning was small, your later days will be very great. If you read that close enough, you'll realize that what Bildad is saying is that, listen, Job, your kids were dirty sinners who got what they deserved. But if you repent, you will get lots of great stuff. What do you think? You think that made Job feel better? Job didn't. Zophar, you can imagine like in this time while Eliphaz and Bildad talk, like Zophar is kind of back in the corner and he's got his arms crossed and probably as they're talking, he's kind of like... <laughs> And so finally they get done and he steps up and he's like, you know, step aside, guys. I'll show you how you offer comfort and consolation to somebody who's hurting. This is what Zophar says, Job chapter 11, verses one through six. Should a multitude of words go unanswered? And should one full of talk be vindicated? Should your babble put others to silence and then, and when you mock, shall no one shame you? For you say, my conduct is pure and I am clean in God's sight. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you and that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom for wisdom is many-sided. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. Huh? So far, that's a good friend, right? He's saying, you know what, Job? You got off easy. You deserved worse than to lose everything that you have, including all of your children. So these these friends, they traveled from afar to come and and, and they they said why we're coming. We're coming to comfort and console him. Give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. How'd they do? Did they do a great job? Are you feeling comforted as you read that? Do you feel consoled? So throughout the book, each friend will give more speeches and Job will talk back. But in everything that they say, it is fraught with error. They are not very good at this. And we can read that and think, my gosh, I mean, these are just, this is a caricature. Nobody could ever possibly do that. But but let me ask you this. When you have faced sadness, suffering, grief, tragedy in your life, have you ever had an experience where a well-intentioned person came to try and offer you comfort, but what they had to say did not actually make you feel better? And in fact, it made you feel worse. There's a lot of heads nodding in the room right now. See, I think we can all agree that these three jokers are not the people we want coming over when the family goldfish dies. But who do we want? 
What kind of person do we want to have show up when we are up against it and in the darkest moments of our life? And further, how do we become that kind of person? How do we become the person who can actually bring comfort and consolation to those who suffer and are in pain? Because I know none of us, you know, none of us, we don't want to be a bunch of bill dads here, right? But sometimes we stumble into it. There's a story on staff and in the Stevens family that has become quite legendary. When Bill Stevens, our, our lead pastor, um, was going to get tires uh, for his truck, and he went to the tire shop, and he had found out that the day before, the, the gentleman who owned the shop had been killed, tragically. Um, but he, he walks in, and he's very surprised to see this gentleman's wife is actually at work, working behind the counter that day. Um, and he's a little, like, caught off guard, didn't expect to see her there. And he walks up, and he, and he says, like, oh, my gosh, like, I, I heard. I'm, I'm so sorry. How are you doing? And she says, yeah, you know, my, my husband was killed in a tragic motorcycle accident yesterday. And Bill stood there, and he looked at her, and he said, that's wild. That's wild. <laughs> so now on staff, anytime anybody does something, like, awkward, we're just like, Mm, that's wild, you know? Like, um, I assume that after that, he asked if he could get a discount on some all-weather tires or something like that. But um, th we joke about it, right? You don't, nobody means to say that, but sometimes things come out of our mouth. We're like, oh, that was the wrong thing to say, right? I spent this past week asking people I knew for other examples of things people say when someone is hurting that actually don't make things better. So here's my list. See if you've ever heard in these. And I just gotta confess, most of them I've said. So, um, hey, hey, look at this as a growth experience. Yeah, there's a good one. Um, or, well, at least X didn't happen, right? Like just, it could have been worse, right? Um, at least you have your health. Hey, everything happens for a reason. Every dark cloud has a silver lining, or it's sanctified church version. Um, you know, every time God closes a door, he opens a window. Sometimes you just say, you know, it's all going to work out. Or uh, God won't give you more than you can handle. Uh, I've spent a decent amount of time in my life reading through the Bible, and it appears to me to just be a collection of stories of people who've all received more than they can handle and then have to rely on God to help them through it. When I was in college, uh, my, my cousin was a couple years behind me, but we went to the same school, um, and we'd been very close throughout our lives, and she went through a really painful breakup in college. Um, she and this guy had dated for a long time, and she was sad and heartbroken. And she told me one time that she went to speak to a mentor that she had in this campus ministry she was a part of, and just kind of saying, you know, I'm just, I'm really sad. And her mentor said, you know, Tessa, um, you are being sinful because you're sad, because that means you're not trusting God's plan. Huh? It's a sin to be sad. I can only assume that this mentor hadn't read many of the Psalms. There's 150 of them in the Bible, and the majority of them are, are what are called songs of lament, which is literally just heartbroken people complaining to God about the ways running the universe. But, um, but no, she was being sinful. Maybe you've had an experience where, where you shared something painful in your life and, and the person you were talking to immediately compared it to something that they had gone through that minimized your experience or made the conversation about them instead of what you were feeling. Or how about this one? Part of my story that we'll be talking about later in this talk is that for a long time, my wife and I uh, longed and desired to be parents and we, we struggled to do so. Now, there's a lot of people. That's a, that is a silent thing that afflicts so many of us and can make you feel so alone. But I tell you what, if I had $10 for every time somebody heard that about me and then couldn't wait to tell me about a friend of a friend who tried really hard to get pregnant for a long time and then they finally gave up and as soon as they gave up, they got pregnant. So just stop, stop stressing and worrying about it. And I just want to say, I, I'm certain that people in this room have told that story to somebody. And I know you meant to offer them hope. But can I just say, for those of us who have been in that camp, that story does not help us. Don't say that story anymore. There's a lot of ways to get this wrong. 
There's a lot of ways that we can make mistakes, but how do we get it right? How do we actually become a person who is helpful? Because I know we get, we get scared. We're afraid, right? You're a, you go into that situation and you know somebody that you care about is hurting, and you're afraid because you don't know what to do, and we, gen- we generally end up doing one of two things. We either say and do nothing, we just avoid it entirely, or we do something that minimizes that person's experience, or we rush them to get past it and just be okay now. All of those things on that list that I just read that people shared with me, basically all of those are saying, like, just hurry up and be okay, right? Every time God closes a door, he opens a window, right? So stop, stop bringing your door, your closed door into my life. Let's just focus on the future. Let me just rush you. Let me hurry you through this experience. So here's how we can show up differently for people who are grieving, who are hurting. I've got three steps. Here's step one. Step one is this. We have to recognize our own discomfort with other people's pain. And we have to be able to hold it and look at it and know that this is going to make me uncomfortable and then you've got to walk right through that. And you have to embrace that pain in your own life and your own discomfort. It's a really natural thing. We, as humans, we resist other people's pain. We resist other people's grief because it reminds us that could happen to me. It reminds us, you know, I have pain in my life too. And as people, we prefer to pretend like everything's okay even when it isn't, right? That's why when we ask, what's the most common way that we ask somebody how they're doing when we know they've been through something bad? Hey, are you doing okay? Why do we say it that way? Because we want you to say yes so that I can move on. Have you ever walked up to somebody and been like, hey, are you doing terrible? Even though you know they are. It's built into our very language, our discomfort with discomfort, our desire for people to say, yeah, I'm fine, so that we can move on. We've got to learn to get, to be willing to accept our own discomfort. Because otherwise, we, we, you know, we'll do that and we'll move on. Or, or what's even worse and just as common is that we will just assure people that everything will be okay. But we don't know that. We'll just tell you, no, no, it's all, it's all going to be fine. You know, I shared that, you know, struggling to become parents was a long part of my family's story. Well, that comes from the fact that um, previous to that, my wife had struggled with an autoimmune disorder that ultimately led to, to her body destroying her kidneys and her need for a transplant. And I, because of that, there have been multiple times in our marriage and our life together when we've had really scary medical situations. And I can remember so many people saying, hey, it's going to be okay. It's going to be good. She's going to be fine. In fact, I really specifically remember a time a person said, hey, Chris, like, Lindsay is so special. God won't let anything bad happen to her. And I know that this person was well-intentioned. But the truth is, really awful things happen to really wonderful people. Really good people face really painful chapters in their life. And you don't know. You don't know that it's all going to work out. But I had an even deeper problem with that because if you follow that chain of theology to its obvious end, right? She's so special that God won't let bad things happen to her, right? But you said that to me while something really bad is happening. And if bad results in our life are connected in some way to whether we are special or good enough, then you have just said that she is bad and has deserved this. See, we can read what Zophar had to say. You know what, Job, you actually deserved worse. And think, who would ever say that? But we can dress that same phrase, that same theology up in lace and say it to people all the time. Assuring a person who is facing struggle, trial, grief, pain, and saying it's all going to be fine, ultimately isn't helpful. Lindsay and I, Lindsay's my wife, we were talking about this part of the sermon just last night and remembering all of these really lovely, well-intentioned people who told us that everything would be fine. 
And what, th these were, what she had to say, she's like, you know, as I think back on that, I just remember how small it made God feel. As if whether or not God is a good God was defined by what happens in my life. It just put God in this box that if you do what I ask, then you can be God. But otherwise, I walk away. Our discomfort can make, like, we're uncomfortable, so I want to tell you everything's going to be fine so that I get to be comfortable again. But there's another thing that can happen if we don't actually look at our own pain and discomfort, right? And that other thing is we just do nothing. We end up avoiding that person. We end up avoiding those people and making them feel more and more and more alone. I could, this, was, this was how I acted for most of my life. I can remember having the thought all the time, maybe you can relate, thinking, knowing something had happened and being like, you know, I don't want to bring it up. I don't want to make him sad. You know, I, 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 I don't want to bring, if he wants to talk to me about that, I totally will listen, but I don't, I don't want to bring it up. But here's the truth. Um, another part of my story, when I was 24 years old, my dad passed away quite unexpectedly. And it, in the time that followed that, as I was most heavily grieving it, you know, it did not happen one single time that somebody asked me, Chris, I just have been thinking about you. How, how's your grieving process going? How's your family doing? Not once did it happen that I went, oh my gosh, I had forgotten my dad died. Why would you bring that up? Now I have to feel it again. That never happened. It was the controlling narrative of my internal life. It's all I thought about. But I didn't want to bring it up because I could feel that other people were uncomfortable with my grief. And my head would be like, well, I don't want to bum everybody out, so I don't want to talk about it. The times that people asked, invited me to share were the greatest gifts to me because in those times I didn't have to feel alone. Because here's the thing, grief makes you feel alone because you know, you feel it that people can't handle what's happening in my life right now. There was a time, so I was 24 when this happened. I had moved from Missouri to California. My dad died seven weeks after I got there. So I hadn't had a lot of time to build like deep relationships with people in California. But I was in seminary and I lived in this little community of people and I was fortunate enough that there were some people in that community who I had just met who clearly had been through a little more in their life. And I remember so clearly one time, a, a family, they were old, you know, I'm 24, they were in their like mid to late 30s. Uh, Susan and Steve um, and their little son, Berto, invited me over to their house for dinner one night. And so I went and, you know, we sat down, they greeted me and Susan served the food. And then when she sat down, she looked me right in the eyes and she said, Chris, tell me about your dad. What was he like? What did he, what did he do? What do you remember about him from your childhood? What will you miss most? And she just invited me to speak what was already in my heart. That was the greatest gift that anyone did for me in that time. That's step one. If we are going to care well for people, we have to acknowledge our own discomfort and we have to press forward anyways. Here's step two, just show up. This part's easy, right? Just actually show up. Your physical, literal presence matters a lot. At our house, uh, I, have, I have two daughters, they're five and eight, and sometimes they have bad dreams and they wake up afraid. And we keep in our bedroom a, um, a little kid's sleeping bag. And so if the girls wake up in the middle of the night and they're afraid, they know I can walk into mom and dad's room, put myself back to sleep in that sleeping bag. And you know what? It works every time. They fall right back asleep and they're able to finish their night of sleep. Why? Because physically being near someone who loves you makes getting past scary things easier. If you can just be close when that person that you know, that you love, that you care about is hurting, show up, get close to them. But we have to be present in more than just body. We have to actually allow ourselves to become present in what's happening in their head and in their heart. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by asking questions. I think the thing I hear most often when I tell people I'm a care pastor, and that means like I go to hospitals and visit people who are sometimes dying, who are ill, and they say, oh my gosh, I just, I wouldn't know what to say. Well, I don't know what to say either, right? 
Because it's not about what you say. Unless you are a wizard, you don't have magical words that can fix whatever is wrong in someone's life. That's not the goal. It's not like you can come up with the perfect piece of advice to lay out and then be like, oh, thank you, I'm not sad anymore. It's not about what you say. It's about giving a grieving, hurting person a chance to share and being a person who says, I will sit with you. I will witness this with you. I will bear witness to the pain that you have and just prove that I'm willing to be here with you in it. I will not be among the people who are gonna pull back, are gonna stay away, are gonna make you feel like they can't handle what's happening in your life right now. If you read through Job, you'll notice something. None of Job's three friends ever ask him a question. They come and they start talking and they try to explain away everything that has happened. That's not what Job needed. He needed somebody who would join him in the ashes and be with him so that he didn't have to walk through that alone. That was step two, show up. Here's step three. This one's harder. Step three is to carry other people's burdens as best as you can. And I'm not as good at this one, but I am fortunate enough in my life to have met someone who was. And so I brought this. Uh, This little bound book is a collection of emails sent back and forth between my wife and I and a woman named Sally. Sally lived down the street from us um, right after we had gone through our transplant and were hoping to adopt babies. And if you know anyone in your life who has walked a path of adoption, you know that's a rugged road. But Sally, who uh, I think is in her late 80s now, had lived a little bit more life than we have and was the most prayerful person still to this day that I've ever met in my life. And she became our help and our friend, our support as we walked through this. And so... um, After our our kids were born and and we had adopted them, uh, my wife, Lindsay, actually printed out the whole collection of our emails back and forth. And on the front of this, it says, prayers for my babies. This is the collection of, of how we got through those days that our girls will someday know this was an important piece of your story. And so I just wanna share with you something that Sally wrote to us. Um, You... This is kind of in between other messages, so there'll be some parts that you won't understand, but I think you'll get the gist of it. So it starts with, this is Lindsay's, my wife's, email to Sally on March 14th, 2013. Hi, Sally. Thank you for praying for us and for your words. The fear of being heartbroken over this baby feels so large. At this time, we had been matched with a birth mother, a pregnant young woman, um, But in the state of California, no adoption is final until the baby has been born and the birth mother has left hospital property and can then sign um, a piece of paper. And so it's this like very tenuous, scary time. So the fear of being heartbroken over this baby feels so large. I've had so much heartbreak. It feels that my soul doesn't feel that it can handle more. Though the Lord has always kept me strong through it all, I just desire his mercy on me in this situation. Please continue to keep us in your prayers and our birth mother as she is struggling so much. I am seeking to trust the Lord in this, seeking so much. It's so hard. And I have seven of my 10 bridesmaids who are pregnant and due in May, June, and July, so my grief seems to be lurking everywhere. Thanks for letting me ramble to you. I appreciate all the prayers you have given me and Chris and take great comfort in you being our new neighbor. This is Sally's response. Ah, dear Lindsay, that is not a ramble from you. It's a pleading heart that desires something with every fiber of your being. I know. When I wrote my reply yesterday, there was one more thing I wanted to add. I know from experience that when I have something that is very, very important to me and I importune God for that, I find that I get more and more fearful, tenser and tenser, and that in a sad way, God becomes more my adversary than my friend. I see him as someone I have to beg to give me what I need. Then I start to see him as tight-fisted. Then I don't trust. Then my fear grows. Recognize that pattern? And here we have a God who tells us that he delights to give us the kingdom. But we all start believing the evil one's lies as our fear grows bigger. 
That's why I said that the only way I know to find peace is in surrendering the need to him. And then coming to him as that small child that hangs on to the father with such trust and love that nothing can tear you away. No words, no repeated asking, just being with him. That isn't easy. And that is where the body of believers comes in. Let your friends and family do the importuning on your behalf. Let us cry out to God for you. You just hang on. We're enough removed that fear will not tear at us as it does you. I have found that in times of stress, after I have asked that I need to stop asking and just crawl into his lap and sit there, so to speak. Then my brothers and sisters do the lifting for me. I spent some time this morning praying for you, asking God to guard the mind of the birth mother and keep her stable in her decision to give you the baby. I came against the powers of darkness that would try to step in and harm you as a follower of Jesus. I prayed for your peace. I will not stop entreating the Lord on your behalf until that baby is in your arms and the paper is signed. We will have our prayer team call out on your behalf as well. You rest in him, dear Lindsay and Chris. This is not a time of warfare for you. You are worn out. You've been through too much. We're we're all in this together. Let us do the heavy lifting. With much love and big hugs, Sally. P.S. When you feel yourself sinking, please phone and just say, this is Lindsay and Chris, I need prayer. We will only say, you've got it, and hang up. And then we will go and pray until we feel peace. Come over us and know you are better. Do we have a deal? Sally hoped for us when we couldn't hope anymore. And she prayed for us when we couldn't pray anymore. She carried our burdens in a way that we didn't even know another person could. When she said, we will keep asking, you stop and you just try, try as hard as you can to find comfort in the fact that your God loves you. You see, in this life, there can be no true comfort offered to anyone else without taking some pain into yourself. It will cost you to care for other people. To love deeply means to lose deeply. There just is no other way. There's an author named Henry Nowen who I've loved to read for a long time, and he wrote a book called The Wounded Healer where he talks about this idea that to be a person who truly heals others, you have to be in touch with your own woundedness. And in that book, he said this, for one man needs another to live. And the deeper he is willing to enter into the painful condition, which he and others know, the more likely it is that he can be a leader leading his people out of the desert into the promised land. I know we all desire when we love somebody who's in the desert to be able to help them move forward. And we can only do it in as much as we are willing to acknowledge and to step into our own woundedness and that we are willing to let their pain affect us. I will never ever in my life forget Sally Russ. Because she never pushed us to pretend that it wasn't nighttime. She just came and sat next to us in the dark. There's a old Austrian poet and novelist named Rainer Maria Rilke. And I've never been much of a poetry guy, but I've been trying to read poetry later because in my life I can approach things more like an engineer, right? Where I just want to, like, I can be very kind of bookish like that. And this forces me to stop and question and embrace mystery. And so for the last couple of years, I've tried to read through this one book and I still haven't finished it yet, but... But there's one that really, one poem. This is, a, this is his book called The Book of Hours, Love Poems to God. He's a man of very deep faith. And he wrote this. God speaks to each of us as he makes us, then walks with us silently out of the night. These are the words we dimly hear. You, sent out beyond your recall, go to the limits of your longing. Embody me. Flare up like flame and make big shadows I can move in. Let everything happen to you, beauty and terror, 
Just keep going. No feeling is final. Don't let yourself lose me. Nearby is the country they call life. You will know it by its seriousness. Give me your hand. The stanza that I cannot forget. Where he says, let everything happen to you. Beauty and terror. Just keep going. No feeling is final. Don't let yourself lose me. To truly offer comfort and consolation to the people that we love, we have to keep going. Through the beauty and the terror, we have to meet them in the nighttime so that they don't have to face that terror alone. Would you all pray with me? Jesus, help us to be the kind of friend who will sit with others in the dark so that they won't face the terror alone. And Jesus, we thank you that you are no stranger to the nighttime. That thousands of years before you were born on this earth, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about you, calling you a man of sorrows. And told us that you would be one who comes alongside us, who would carry our infirmities, our pain, our burdens. That you would take that pain onto yourself and that by your bruises we would be healed. God, we ask for that healing for ourselves and we ask for the strength to follow in that model that we could show up and be people who bring healing to those we most love. Amen.